In a world where Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes exist, it's easy to look up the aggregate review score for something rather than an individual review. This is especially true in gaming, as when a major release drops, over a hundred reviews are suddenly published and no one has time to read them all. Combined scores don't always do a game justice and this approach means that some releases end up slipping through the cracks. Critical nuance gets mixed, more analytical breakdowns of what works and what doesn't gets missed, and all round while these sites are super helpful tools, you can just miss out on solid word of mouth recommendations. Now, I don't know about you, and you can check out the What Culture Gaming podcast episode, Clearly Bad Games That We Love Anyway, for more, but there's something about a good 6 out of 10 game that makes me cherish it even more. The games that might not nail every animation, might not feel like the most polished or those designed to bring in as much money as possible, but the games that tried, and that was enough. In fact, sometimes it's more than enough. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are nine video games that got terrible reviews, but were actually great. Number 9. Jurassic World Evolution Game adaptations of films have a long, murky history. Examples like GoldenEye 007 were critically acclaimed, but others like Aliens Colonial Marines and Star Trek from 2013 were heavily criticized and for good reason. It is a low bar to clear, and some just end up limboing it until it hits them in the face. While that totally applies to the Jurassic World movie, its tie-in Jurassic World Evolution is a surprisingly authentic park maintenance sim. Helmed by Frontier Development, Jeff Goldblum Bryce Dallas Howard and B.D. Wong all reprise their film roles in-game, allowing players to build their own Jurassic World theme park, complete with attractions and facilities, it received criticism for its contract system and a lack of depth, with some reviews noting a lack of tutorial guidance after establishing the basics. For those who grew up with Jurassic Park though, there's an undeniable joy at running your own park. Not only does it capture the essence of something like Zoo Tycoon, but it also has a gradual difficulty curve that keeps gameplay interesting. Combined with park exploration, creating new dinosaurs through DNA splicing and the unlockable free play mode, it's worth looking past the flaws. Especially seeing as one of the bonus missions is unleashing the T-Rex to test your security systems. Number 8. Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2 Castlevania has seen a revival of interest thanks to the phenomenal Netflix show. Seriously, go watch at least the pilot and you'll fall in love like I did. So much so that Konami then went on to release the originals in HD. Despite this, however, it's a franchise that hasn't seen a new main entry since 2014, and that game was Lords of Shadow 2, something that had a divisive reception to say the least. Taking a break from convention, it's the only Castlevania to feature Dracula as the playable character, providing an open-world approach compared with the linear progression of the first Lords of Shadow. It released to a mixed response, with gameplay receiving unfavorable comparisons to God of War. There was also the wide criticism of the game's visuals, with modern-day elements and enemy designs being targeted. Combat was so satisfying though, feeling smooth, empowering, varied, and with many awesome boss fights. There's no indication as to whether Konami will ever develop another Castlevania, but for now, this fills the gap, especially if you want to mimic the badass anime acrobatics of the show. Number 7. Lost Sphere the idea of spiritual successes has always been prevalent in gaming, where new developers seek to emulate gameplay mechanics of a successful game. Tokyo RPG Factory made this especially clear with Lost Sphere, acting as a successor to their previous title I Am Setsuna, which already followed on the example of RPG classic Chrono Trigger for the SNES. Lost Sphere's story begins in Elgoth, where a group of friends Kanata, Lumina, and Locke discover the entire village has disappeared, engulfed in nothing but white mist. As they seek out refuge, Kanata discovers that he has the ability to restore those lost using memories, and sets out to restore the lost parts of the world. The game's design is practically identical to I Am Setsuna, utilizing the same visual approach and adding minimal changes to combat outside the hulking Volko suits, which just means that every character gets a mech. As a result, Lost Sphere was often criticized for its lack of innovation and a failure to build upon I Am Setsuna's flaws, but what the developers offered was a nostalgic adventure from top to bottom, one that stays engaging through combat and is highly recommended to old-school 90s JRPG fans. Number 6. Lost Planet Extreme Condition 
Lost Planet is a franchise we've not heard from since the last console generation. One of Capcom's bigger franchises on the Xbox 360 and PS3, this third-person shooter initially released in 2006, later becoming a trilogy and even getting a 3DS spin-off. Extreme Condition focuses on the story of EDN3, a fictional planet gripped in a brutal ice age. After the Earth becomes uninhabitable due to war and pollution, humanity plans to colonize the icy world under the orders of the NEVEC, a mega corporation now acting as the human government. Discovering it's inhabited by an insectoid alien species called the Acrid, humanity loses the war and falls into a nomadic existence as snow pirates. The game released to a bit of a mixed reception, with the story facing criticism for being pretty damn convoluted, and many took issue with the voice acting overall. Combat was the strong point though, being able to switch between on-foot travel and mechanized suits known as vital suits. These were a lot of fun to control, and you were able to use heavy weaponry, as Lost Planet gave you some genuinely interesting enemy species to gun down. Number 5. Batman Arkham Origins the Arkham game that time and Rocksteady forgot. While no one wants a game from a former developer's parent company put together in two years with none of the original cast returning, over time Origins has thankfully garnered some respect from those who'll still give it a shot. Return today and you'll find something just as good as Arkham Asylum or Arkham City. New gadgets like the remote claw let you tether enemies together or launch canisters at them automatically. Procedurally generated crimes in progress give Gotham streets a bit of life, and making sure the best upgrades only unlock if you experiment with every move at your disposal was a masterstroke. Best of all, we've got a far more brutal Batman still acting out his rage on Gotham's underbelly, holding Penguin aloft with one arm before crushing a goon's throat with his knee because they wouldn't talk fast enough. Immediately, it's a far more compelling portrayal of the character than the logger-headed a-hole of Arkham City, and that staple getting lost in the darkness of his work side of Batman fiction comes through clearer than ever. Go play Arkham Origins if you're waiting for whatever the hell is coming next. It is pretty damn good, especially in retrospect. Number 4. Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex Okay, this needs an age-based caveat, because while I'm totally in the camp of give me Naughty Dog's crash games or give me death, I am reliably informed by the youth residing in the office that Wrath of Cortex was a damn fine platformer if it was your first taste of the series' signature gameplay. Positive thoughts, right? Positive thoughts. So the fourth main installment of the series, Wrath of Cortex, saw Uka Uka and Dr. Cortex working to power up a new super weapon by awakening the Elementals, a rogue group of masks which hold power over Earth earth, water, fire, and air. Facing a series of disasters across the earth, Aku Aku and Crash then set out to imprison the elementals once more. Critics and me took issue with Wrath of Cortex for a lack of innovation, focusing on what hadn't changed from the originals and how it repeated the same platforming mechanics. This was certainly not an objectively bad thing though, as they were incredibly solid mechanics to ape, and Wrath of Cortex was still an awesome platforming adventure. If you've played through the Insane Trilogy remakes and are patiently awaiting the next entry, I am reliably informed that Wrath of Cortex fits the bill. Number 3. Bionic Commando from 2009 Bionic Commando came as part of Capcom's efforts to reboot the NES-era franchise, starring Nathan Rad Spencer with his bionic arm. Employing now-defunct developer Grin, this project first began with Bionic Commando Rearmed in 2008, remaking the original NES game to critical and commercial success. Developed alongside Rearmed though, Bionic Commando released in May 2009 for PS3, Xbox 360 and PC, ditching 2D platforming for a grittier 3D action adventure. Taking place 10 years after Rearmed, we find Nathan freed from imprisonment after the Great Bionic Purge to fight a terrorist threat that unleashed an earthquake on Ascension City. Yes, let's get one thing out the way. The infamous plot twist that Nathan Rad Spencer's wife was living in his arm all along was always completely crazy. I'm not here to defend that, and the game's story was, you know, kind of terrible. Of course, these things didn't help reviews, and poor sales tanked the chances of another sequel. Still though, Bionic Commando was a genuinely fun title that offered solid action mechanics, making good use of Nathan's bionic arm and providing a fresh take on an old series. With some pretty cool swinging mechanics, it is certainly worth a shot, providing you can get your hands on a copy. Number 2. Metroid Other M 
It was always going to be tough for any developers to follow up on that immaculate Metroid Prime trilogy. Developed by Team Ninja and releasing back in 2010 for the Nintendo Wii, Metroid Other M was a notable departure, abandoning the first-person perspective for a third-person view, introducing melee combat and placing a heavier emphasis on story. Set between Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion, Other M sees Samus investigate a distress signal coming from an abandoned bottleship, discovering that elements within the Galactic Federation have been conducting research on bio weapons, a practice long outlawed within the Federation. The game attempted to develop Samus as a character, focusing on her relationship with her former commanding officer Adam Malkovich, and exploring her past too. Much like Bionic Commando though, a lot of criticism was made of the story, with reviews often taking issue with Samus's characterization and others lamenting an abundance of cutscenes. Core gameplay was hard to fault though, and a surprisingly cool control scheme let you aim with motion controls before turning the controller sideways to mimic an NES part. It was graphically impressive for its time and felt like a genuine evolution of the Metroid franchise. If you can get past the flaws in the writing and just focus on gameplay, it's totally worth playing. And number one, Deadly Premonition. I adore Deadly Premonition. Yes, the animations are terrible, the enemies sound like they're doing an underwater impression of Abraham Simpson, and the frame rate sinks to single digits when you're driving around in the remaster, but to focus on all that is to miss the point. Because Deadly Premonition has one quality that shines above all else, charm. Madcap creative director Hidetaka Sweary65 Sahiro clearly had an infatuation with David Lynch and Twin Peaks, and he set about crafting Deadly Premonition as one giant piece of interaction active detective fiction. Elongated drives from A to B see Agent York riff on his favorite Hollywood movies. A day-night cycle governs when you should do everything from speak to witnesses to grab food at a diner, and if you stand in one spot, you'll actually see all the other characters going about their daily routines. Speaking of characters too, there are so many quotable lines and memorable individuals, catchy pieces of music, and above all, a feeling that in the end, it does somehow come together. Deadly Premonition was savaged by the majority of critics for all obvious reasons, but if you can put up with animatronic cutscenes and stock combat, it's very much worth a trip to Greenvale, demonic warts and all. And those are just some suggestions of those 6 out of 10 games that are totally awesome anyway. Let me know your favourites down in the comments below, and please check out the What Culture Gaming podcast if you have the time. For now, I've been Scott from whatculture.com, and I'll catch you soon.